This is a presentation of the Center for Advanced Study at the University of Illinois. For over 50 years, the Center for Advanced Study has brought together scholars from diverse disciplines and backgrounds, encouraging and rewarding excellence in all areas of academic inquiry at Illinois, one of the nation's premier public universities. For more information about this presentation and other center activities, please visit cas.illinois.edu. Jane Desmond, Professor of Anthropology and convener of this year's campus-wide initiative sponsored by the Center for Advanced Study called Knowing Animals, Histories, Strategies, and Frontiers in Human-Animal Relations. Welcome to the final event of our series. I see a lot of faces here I've seen throughout the year. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a terrifically exciting year for this initiative with speakers addressing issues in law, the history of science and evolution, art history, veterinary care, primates, and humans. We've hosted public lectures, live performances like hominid and elephant, and have sponsored an interdisciplinary graduate seminar. I am so grateful to the Center for Advanced Study and to our co-sponsors, the Department of Anthropology, the Department of Animal Sciences, the Institute of Genomic Biology, the Neuroscience Program, and the College of Liberal Arts for their commitment to exploring this important set of issues that engage multiple schools across campus. At the Center for Advanced Study, I especially want to thank Deputy Director Dr. Masumi Uriye and Publicity Coordinator Lisa Wildhagen for their crucial support. You're all here, you've all seen the advertisements, so they've been doing an incredible job. I also want to thank thank my faculty advisory committee who worked with me starting a year in advance to bring this idea to fruition and helped shape it. They deserve mention by name. The following faculty, professors in the departments of anthropology, that would be Paul Garber, Eleonora Stopino in Italian, Deke Weaver in art and new media, Jean Robinson in entomology, Janice Jaraska in psychology, Eric Freifogel in the law school, Mark Mitchell in the College of Veterinary Medicine, Robert Parr in the Department of Political Science, Chip Burkhart in History, Amy Fisher in the Department of Animal Sciences, Spencer Schaffner in the Department of English, Jennifer Monson in the Department of Dance, Lori Hagen in the Department of Art, an extraordinary group who has come together across so many disciplinary boundaries. Their advice, enthusiasm, and thoughtful engagement in tough issues has been crucial to our success in pulling off a truly interdisciplinary series of events. They have been inspiring to me, as have the students in my related graduate seminar. Special thanks also to Michelle Hanks for her tireless assistance. So it's our last event. Let me turn now to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Andrew Rowan, Chief Scientific Officer of the Humane Society of the United States and CEO of Humane Society International. Dr. Rowan holds a PhD in biochemistry from Oxford University in the UK, where he was also a Rhodes Scholar. Throughout his career, he has been active in seeking links between science and humane initiatives and was elected by his peers as a fellow to the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Prior to joining the Humane Society of the United States, he served as director of the Tufts University Center for Animals and Public Policy, a unique program in the United States, and also chaired the Environmental Studies Department at the Tufts University School of Veterinary Medicine. He is the author and editor of several publications, including the 1984 book called Mice, Models, and Men, and for the past several years has co-authored the annual State of the Animals Report, published by the Humane Society Press. Humane Society International is one of the most comprehensive international NGOs working in the field of animal rescue and animal welfare. 
They are still there in Haiti, assisting Haitian people and Haitian vets in caring for their animals in the aftermath of the devastating earthquake. And they are there now in Japan, on the ground in the most dangerous areas, again helping local teams rescue animals now that most of the people have been removed to safety. Yet thousands of pets remain stranded in the cordoned off area of the Fukushima reactor, and they are at work there. Dr. Rowan has, for 30 years, been a leader in helping us understand the scientific and international dimensions of human relations with animals, and his breadth of experience and his combination of scientific and humanitarian work make him a fitting final speaker for our series, which has crossed so many disciplinary boundaries. Please join me in welcoming him. Thank you very much, Dr. Desmond. I'm not sure my mic's on. OK, so I don't need to be tied to the floor mic. Um, I've got a lot to cover. I've uh, put together a fair amount of material um, that sketches back um, the, our attitudes and our interactions with animals um, back into uh, prehistoric times, or well, maybe not quite so far back, but certainly medieval reformation, uh, modern thinking, which I consider to be um, uh, 1800s and, uh, and uh, more recently, the current period attitudes. And I have a few comments to make about animal rights and animal welfare uh, at the end of the talk. But for, for the most part, this is not going to be an animal protection talk. It's really going to be an examination of our attitudes to animals, why we, why we think what we do, why we do what we think, and so on. Um, in terms of the sort of classical period, um, the classical goes back to about 400 AD, 500 BC to 400 AD, the medieval from 400 to 1500 Reformation. And the historical approaches, I've always felt, carry very important lessons for what we're doing today. If we don't really know history, it's that old aphorism, you're doomed to repeat it. So um, the classical attitude, I mean, animals have always been a very important part of human society. Uh, gods have appeared as animals. Um, uh, animals uh, are gods. Um, the myths of the human-animal hybrids are widespread throughout uh, human civilizations. Animals have been considered to share human char uh, characteristics. And Richard Sarabji, a classic scholar, set out to write a book on ancient Greeks um, thinking about theory of mind and ended up writing it about the way the ancient Greeks thought about animals. Um, and he found that their thinking then is as muddled as our thinking today. So Aristotle uh, and Plato and the, uh, the rest were, are not very good guides in terms of that. Moving on, um, you, what you found was that the Christian revolution after, uh, after Jesus uh, was very concerned to define selves in contrast to the Jews, the pagans, and also to animals. So you begin to see some notion here, wait a minute, we're different in kind. We're not different in degree, we're different in kind. But for, prior to that, it was a matter of degree and there was a lot of uh, br breaking of boundaries. But the Christian theology was very concerned about making sure that the, uh, the kind was established. Uh, they rejected the Greco-Roman ideas, array the human-animal similarities. They changed the dietary laws. The Manichaeans were a Christian sect in the sort of three to 400 AD. Uh, whom uh, St. Augustine was very concerned about because he felt that their attitudes about vegetarianism and asceticism were very seductive to the communities at the time, and he wanted to show that Manichaeans were, in fact, uh, heterodox rather than orthodox, and that Christian orthodoxy required that you ate meat. And the animal fables, the Aesopian Aes fables that were used as morality tales to try and explain how we should behave and why we do what we do, uh, fell into disfavor. No longer would you use animal stories to, as morality tales. Um, moving, moving into the medieval, early medieval time, um, there was a lot of issues about the animals that you have uh, provided labor, food, and status. Um, there was a lot of concern about, well, are you what you eat? If animals are beasts, if we eat animals, will that make us beastly? That was one of the things that St. Augustine was concerned about. Um, no dogs were eaten, um, no carnivores. The flesh is corrupted because they eat other animals. Um, as society stratified, the animals kept and the food eaten 
signal status. And you can see the status, the war horse was the highest status, the hunting dog next, labor, and then finally food. So there was a, if, you, if you had war horses, you had a high status. Um, as the century changes, the uh, 12th century, you get now late medieval period, you begin to see animals coming back into fabula stories, into morality tales. And uh, the Physiologus, which was a second century doc a book that uh, dealt a lot with animals, was then called upon by the 12th and 13th century scholars to establish bestiaries. They became increasingly popular. Once again, you see the metaphors, the lion is brave, uh, the fox is sly, um, something else is cowardly. And you, you start to see the, um, uh, the, the same sort of morality tales that you saw in ancient Greek times. And people began to say nature is an appropriate subject for study. Rather than God, you can now start studying nature. You could study nature as a reflection of God, but now people are saying nature in itself is an appropriate uh, element for study. So you move into the Reformation and the Industrial Revolution Natural history now becomes very common. Um, uh, the microscope and the telescope open up both the near and the, uh, the, the tiny and the large. Um, people start to classify. Humans have this great tendency and need to classify, sort and classify. And so you had all these different classification schemes with Linnaeus eventually triumphing, but he wasn't the only one. If you go to Malaysian tribal societies, um, the classification schemes are very different. Uh, and everything that crawls is something that crawls. It doesn't matter whether it's an insect or a lizard, and, and so on. So flies and, and things in water. Um, human power over nature um, began to sort of become important, and humans started to do selective breeding, began to show, well, wait a minute, we can, make, we can actually improve nature. There's a very, Carolyn Merchant wrote a very interesting book called Death of Nature back in the 70s, uh, early 80s, in which she was talking about how uh, humans conquered nature. And one of the stories that she tells in there that I found fascinating was that um, there was this big deal about mining in the 1500s that should, in fact, humans mine ore out of the earth. It was like raping mother, uh, mother nature, taking, taking violent, by violent means the material of the earth away from mother nature. And a man by the name of Agricola, I guess appropriately, uh, wrote the, the, the standard argument as how, that this was okay. And the analogy that he used was, well, we've been fishing for millennia, and the fish are underneath the surface of the sea, and we take the fish out of the sea, Therefore, we can take iron ore out of the earth. And so that was part of uh, what led then to the Industrial Revolution and increasing uh, industrialization. Nonetheless, uh, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, an Oxford historian, uh, wrote another important book in which he talks about um, the growing sentimental trends. And he tracked this from about 1300 to about 1700, how people began to become increasingly concerned about how we deal with animals and what we do to them, and so on. These were not periods of time that were particularly uh, um, concerned about pain and suffering. Um, there was an extraordinary amount of it in those times, and if you see some Russell Crowe movies, you will no doubt have seen some of them. Uh, but, I mean, it's, it was a tough life, and, and suffering was just part of what you did. Uh, then, moving up into the 1800s, humanity Dick Martin was the first sort of legislator. Actually, he wasn't. Bismarck was the first person to start legislating animal protection in, in, in uh, Prussia. Um, but humanity Dick Martin uh, came up in, in England with uh, some legislation, and the RSPCA was founded in the, animal t in the 1820s, the first formal um, animal protection organization. Although. Some people sort of point to the Pilgrim Fathers who came over for, to uh, New England uh, as establishing some of the first laws on animal protection. Oh, you should go back to Hammurabi really for that. But the Pilgrim, the, uh, part, I think two of the hundred um, laws that the Pilgrims established dealt with treating animals appropriately. 
in part, um, the pilgrims were concerned about bullfighting and bull baiting and things of that nature because these happened on Sundays when people shouldn't be enjoying themselves, they should be contemplating God instead. And so they were concerned about the sort of licentious behavior associated with some of the animal cruelty um, activities. Um, and they, they wanted to stop and stamp that out as well. Um, there was an increase in sensitivity, sensibility of concern about animal suffering uh, throughout the 1800s. Um, there was a curious Victorian uh, uh, attention, attention to a man of sens sensibility. And um, the notion was that that was the, the best sort of person to be. And uh, people looked to uh, a Victorian woman to provide men of sensibility. Um, because um, you couldn't go out and rape and pillage the British Empire, which of course most of the British um, uh, emigres did. But that was a bad thing to do. You had to come back and be a cultured and civilized man. So there's this pressure to be a man of sensibility. And you get a lot of reform movements. I mean, not just political reform movements, but child labor, labor laws, and other reform, reform movements were common in the 1800s. And then you also get pet keeping uh, beginning. Um, up until about 1800, pet keeping tended to be something that you'd only see in the upper class amongst the aristocracy. But um, you could keep pets and you could develop breed fancies and Harriet Ritvo, a historian, has written very cogently and persuasively that for the middle class, um, breeding a better class of bulldog made them better than their neighbors down the road who didn't have a bulldog with uh, the, uh, the brown nose that was now uh, favored by the, the uh, breed fancy. And so this was a way of sort of one-upping your neighbors, showing you were better. If your dog was well-bred, then you must be well-bred. And so there were all of those sorts of things that were going on, um, uh, aping the aristocracy. And the other thing that happened in, in Europe in the 1870s was that anti-vivisection became a, a, a very big issue. Uh, I, I don't want to say that it was the issue uh, or was a major political issue, but it was a big issue. And people began to debate and argue about this. And Earl of Shaftesbury, who was a leader in the anti-slavery movement, uh, picked up on the anti-vivisection issue in Britain. And in the 1890s, um, there was a lot of arguing and fighting over animal research in uh, the District of Columbia, which was a major center for uh, biomedical research at the time. And you had a bill introduced in 1894 that was supported by Supreme Court justices, by all the major religions, opposed by the American Medical Association and people over at Hopkins and uh, uh, Welsh at Hopkins and so on. Big fight, didn't pass. But there was a lot of activity around this. And eventually, as um, some of the benefits uh, of research began to be, became, become more apparent or apparent benefits, um, the um, support for the bill dissipated, and by 1910, um, it, had, uh, dissip it had gone altogether. So that period of time, those late 1800s, what can we learn about what we're going through today? Well, um, the animal research fight is an interesting one, and there have been several interesting historical um, books written about it. And one of the books by Richard French um, about the Victorian fight over vivisection and anti-vivisection, basically French argues that there was these factors that were important. And I've added this temperance because that was important in the United States. But Darwin, Darwin argued that animals were different from humans in degree, not in kind. That was a very big conceptual deal. And you have the famous debate between the Bishop of Oxford and uh, Julian Huxley, or Thomas Huxley, in which uh, the Bishop of Oxford said, would you rather be descended from an, then you're descended from an ape. And Huxley said, I'd rather be descended from an ape than the Bishop of Oxford. <laughs> so, so, so famous debate. But it really began to, wait a minute, what are we doing here? The Protestant religions uh, had begun to examine the status of animals in their own religious thinking. Wesley, John Wesley, for example, preached that animals had souls. And this was a fairly sort of potent message that was, was bleeding out into the general public. The sanitarians, the public health medical profession, were not happy that this new experimental medicine was taking over the, uh, the roost, so to speak. And they tended to oppose 
experimental medicine. Uh, there were philosophical challenges. Jeremy Bentham's uh, famous phrase, the, the question is not can they speak, but can, or can, uh, but can they suffer, um, was 1789. So just before the beginning of the 1800s. The anatomists, the medical anatomists, also were not crazy about medic the experimental medicine people taking over. And in fact, um, a, a famous anatomist from Edinburgh criticized McGendy and Bernard in, in uh, Paris for doing extraordinarily cruel experiments on animals. Said, this is outrageous, you shouldn't be doing this. There was a feminist gender link. The, uh, the suffragette movement was growing in strength in, in, uh, um, in the UK throughout the 1800s. And there, there seems to me to have been some sort of link. And then in this country, uh, the anti vivisection movement and the animal protection movement made co common cause with the temperance movement, which was very powerful. That's how we got, got to the prohibition era in the 1920s. So you have all of these, and now in the sort of 1950s to the, to the year 2000, we certainly have a, a whole set of thinking and argument about animals, thinking, emotions, cognition, and so on. Um, the behaviorist tradition of Watson and Skinner has given away to cognitive ethology, uh, by and large. Don't think that there's been much of an issue with religion. Don't, not sure about public health, do not think so. Big philosophical challenge. I mean, Peter Singer's book, uh, Animal Liberation in 1975, really just one chapter, uh, that opening chapter, put forward a very simple argument, whether you believe it or not, it's a very simple argument, very clearly stated, and it raised, it, it challenged the issue. It brought a lot of young professionals into the animal protection movement. Um, the feminist gender link, certainly feminism, is uh, a rising political force in America throughout from 1950s onwards, and there was no temperance movement at the time. So you have these similar patterns to what happened in the 19th century to the second half of the 20th century. Okay, so some of the cultural thinking about this sort of stuff. Now, what about the anthropologists? What do they have to say about some of this stuff? Well, Edmund Leach was a famous structural anthropologist from the University of Cambridge. There were a few intellects who came out of Cambridge. Um, he, uh, um, he gave a fascinating talk in 1964. Um, uh, well, it was published in 1964 on the categories of abuse. And um, it's been one of those papers that has been subsequently shown, a lot of his scholarship was shown to be wrong, and yet the large, the big ideas continue to fascinate and, uh, and prompt scholarship. And he noted that there are three categories of, of, of verbal abuse, in English, in other languages, um, profanities, obscenities, and animal terms. And the question here is, terms dealing with God certainly are going to be important to humans and human societies. Terms dealing with sex, it's a very important activity for most human societies. But animal terms, why do they deserve the same status as swear words dealing with God and sex? And what Leach was arguing is that what we're dealing with here is a structural anthropologist, remember. We're dealing with this divide between us and not us. And structural anthropologists get very interested in the tensions, the social tensions that exist in that intermediate phase between us and not us. Mary Douglas write, writes about menstrual blood and about hair. Both of them are of us, but not of us. And when menstrual blood is not of you, it's dangerous, it's very potent. The hair on the floor is dirt, it needs to be wiped up, but when it's on your head, it's fine. And so there's, there's all of these sorts of concerns and tensions around these boundary conditions. So a lot of the animals that we swear by, pigs being a major one, um, are, part, are of us, but not of us. And so they occupy this boundary situation, and there are tensions, inevitably tensions involved with those. And so he suggests that this is the reason why we have animal terms. And what I would argue is that this us-not-us us divide creates a lot of the tensions and a lot of the passions that surround the debate about how we should treat animals. It's not entirely, we, we, go, we keep going back and forth, and I'll come to some of this stuff later. Um, edibility issues, uh, Leach also talked about edibility, and he said pets are not edible, they're too close to us. 
Wildlife is not edible unless it's gone through some sort of hunting ceremony, venison. And pigs uh, have no use except for food and suggested that there may be some additional guilt associated with the fact that a dog you can, uh, or a horse you can ride, a cow can provide milk, and so on and so forth, but pigs are only useful as food. So, so very interesting paper, as I said, was de demonstrated, a lot of the uh, etymological scholarship was shown to be incorrect, but still nonetheless, very rich idea, uh, ideas in this. In terms of today, um, the advertising, animals are used constantly in advertising. And there you have spuds, uh, the Budweiser. Not really sure what, what we're being told by Budweiser about this, but I can tell you the horses will tell you that if you drink Budweiser beer, it's natural, it's going to make you strong and powerful and just good looking. <laughs> That's what it's telling. Now, if Budweiser came out and said, if you drink Budweiser beer, it's going to make you strong, powerful, and good looking, you'd laugh them out of the thing. But if they show the horses trotting down the avenue, you buy into it because it's subliminal. And the Exxon Tiger is very interesting because Exxon gas in England and in Europe is considered more environmentally friendly than other gas. It all comes from the same source. So there's no rational reason for it. But because the tiger was used to um, uh, advertise the gas, uh, it became more environmentally friendly. Disney is a classic example. And this is the uh, image that was in um, uh, Stephen Jay Gould's article about the evolution of Mickey Mouse from a sort of somewhat ratty creature to this neotenized icon that we all love. This happened from 1927 to 1952. And what he's saying is that here are long spindly legs, small eyes, short, uh, uh, sort of longish nose. And what, he's, what you're looking at here is the ears are moving back. The eyes have been enlarged by providing those whites. Um, the, the limbs have been made more um, Stubby, uh, stubbier by providing clothes and all the rest of it. Um, the uh, brain case is larger. These are classic neotenization features. And that neotenizing creatures produces that, ooh, isn't it cute? I never thought babies were that cute, I must admit. <laughs> but, uh, but it produces that sort of response from, uh, from lots of people. It produces an immediate nurturing uh, response. And if you watch the Disney movies, the, the villains are all adult and the heroes are all neotenized. And so the panda is the classic example. World Wildlife Fund has made lots of money out of the panda icon. Classic neotenized creature. The big eye spots, short stubby limbs, looks clumsy, and so on. And then the other factor that's fascinating to me, and that's very little studied, is the whole area of children's stories. Um, and I, I keep wondering why we use animals to the extent that we do in children's stories. And I think part of it is the characters are not ethnic. Um, so it doesn't matter what ethnicity you are. Now, the Berenstein bears, they're bears. They're not, they're not one ethnicity or another. And the characters often carry hidden meanings that are not articulated necessarily, but that uh, come through in the, in the morality stories that we tell there. So Levi Strauss was the one who coined the phrase, animals are good, good to think. And um, it's also true of our modern industrial information-saturated world. Um, we've got Lamb of God, the Dove of Peace. Religious tradition uses many of these sorts of animal images. Detroit Lions, Baltimore Orioles, and the Chicago Bulls. What do you think the Chicago Bulls are trying to say? You know, I mean, the bull is a very masculine, very um, potent male image, which, by the way, is why a bullfighter dresses up in that very effeminate costume if a bullfighter can defeat a bull wearing this very effeminate outfit, then he must be super macho. That's the imagery that all of this sort of stuff displays. So the actual use, interaction with animals today, 160 million pet dogs and cats, uh, 40 million laboratory animals. 9 billion chickens consumed every year in this country, 90 million pigs, about 50,000 racing greyhounds killed, 35% of households feed birds, and about 20% fish. A tremendous array of interactions and, act and activities. 
there's been a general sort of notion that today we have less to do with animals, but in, we have less to do with um, actual interventions and interactions with animals, perhaps. But we still have uh, a very rich zoo, 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 zoology uh, around us. Now, I'm going to talk about Arnie Arluk and Hal Herzog. They're both colleagues of mine. Um, Arnie's a wonderful ethnographer. And um, he has sort of explored uh, these issues as much as anybody and as well as anybody. And here are some, uh, some uh, not exactly sort of quotes from Arnie, but uh, the next few slides will sort of identify a, some, some of the things that he has written, talking about, you know, arguing that relations with animals allow us to imagine what could exist in an ideal human world, a perfect friend or a perfect society. We project onto or through animals because it allows us to express the inexpressible. When vented indirectly via animals, hostility towards human groups may not raise public ridicule. So you cannot easily articulate what we feel, but the treatment of animals taps into and rouses broad cultural anxieties. All of these things, I think, are true and are part of the politics of what we're dealing with at the moment. Arnie wrote uh, together with um, Bogdan, Robert Bogdan, um, he collected these, these postcards. Now, these were postcards that you could get from Kodak um, uh, that they would turn your photographs into postcards, and you could then send them to your friends. So they, they represented images that people had picked for a particular reason. Why, we're not sure, but they picked them. And he collected four or 500 uh, of these postcards and then started looking at how it dealt with, uh, how the animals were dealt with, and illustrating how animals are both distanced and embraced, commoditized and anthropomorphized. And this is a sort of theme that I'm going to develop a, a little bit more uh, as we go through Arnie and Hal's um, arguments. A century ago, Americans killed sparrows in droves for spreading disease. But uh, it's been argued um, that, in fact, this wasn't really a matter that people hated sparrows. It was. Uh, uh, a, some, a sort of physical implementation of people's concern and fear for immigration at the turn of the century. Vast quantities of immigrants were coming into the country. There was very cons considerable concern about them bringing sickness. And, and so you see the sparrows for spreading disease were being uh, um, hunted and, and killed. Um, we stereotype and vilify different animals. This is a uh, 1987, the summer of pit bull hysteria to the nth degree. Uh, Sports Illustrated wrote this, this article, but there were a lot of other hysterical articles about pit bull terriers. And yet the pit bull is viewed um, as adored, not feared. Buster Brown Shoes used the pit bull to market its product. And this is an actual pit bull that's been confiscated from a fighting ring. So, I mean, it's a lot, somewhat different from this animal. And these are the images from earlier, before the pit bull became vilified. Um, he has a sort of uh, recruiting poster, and he has Petey. Doesn't look much like a pit bull, I have to admit that. But um, he is um, a sort of iconography, and in fact, there was. In that Sports Illustrated article, there was an image that I, I haven't made a slide of, of the various dogs and countries of the First World War. And America is a pit bull, Britain's a bulldog, Germany was an Afghan, and I forget what France was. So because animals are so good to think with, we're beginning to find that sociological subfields other than the animal studies group, which has now been sort of institutionalized in the American Sociological Society. Um, rural sociologists are acknowledging that animals are central to rural life. Not all, it wasn't done for, uh, before. Environmental sociologists are putting animals back into the environment. And feminist sociologists and others associated with ethnic uh, uh, marginalization are starting to explore the use of animals to re reinforce the oppression of minorities, like the sparrow, um, the sparrow story just mentioned. So how do, how do we currently view our pets? This is the dominant experience that most of us have with animals is uh, through pets. And 51% regard the, the pet as a companion, 
uh, and 47% as a family member. Most of us, uh, uh, well, half of us allow pets to sleep on our beds, despite the recent scare article that reported that pets can give you disease if you allow them on your beds. Has anybody seen that? I mean, it's, it, if you actually read the article, there is absolutely no evidence cited that anybody got a disease from an animal that was allowed on its bed. But it's, you know, oh, you've got to be careful. Um, and then we have uh, the pet bond, that we have set up standards for companionship that exceed what any human can reasonably provide another person. Unconditional love far outshines anything. And the old saying that I've, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm attached to is a boy's friend provides company, a boy's grandmother provides love, but a boy's dog provides both. <laughs> you know, and this is the sort of iconography here of, of this, but as Arnie points out, no study has shown that improving cure in human sickness is something that animals can do. There's a lot of anecdote, and there's a lot of um, hinting at it, but um, nobody has yet really demonstrated conclusively that that is the case. So it's, you know, it, it's a puzzle, as, uh, as, as Pogo or whoever it was might have said. Uh, so whether a source of fascination, scapegoat for hatred, a symptom of fear, a hope for a quick fix, animals remain good to think with. And there are interspecies looking glass. We see animals and we see ourselves. The other scholar I want to talk about is Hal Herzog. And this is his recent book um, that he's, he doesn't give you any answers. He just asks an awful lot of questions and cites a lot of data showing, talking about inconsistencies. And how, uh, this is a fascinating new tool that any, anybody can play with. It's the Ngram Viewer, it's on Google. And what you can do is you can type in a word and it matters if you use a capital P and a little p as to what, what pattern you get here. And it scans the millions of books that Google has digitized for those words and reports the frequency from 1800 to 2000. And so this, is, this tracks pet keeping. And you can see the beginning of pet keeping in 1840. The end of World War I here is about here. Not much of a change between the wars. And then 1975, extraordinary. Don't know whether that reflects real stuff, although I can tell you that the number of pets, the uh, number of pet dogs in America hasn't changed in relative frequency. The total number has changed because we have more households. The number of cats has increased. Um, he, Hal also looked at beef eating and chicken. And um, one could argue that this is a eat more chicken success story. <laughs> um, but what you've got here is it's about a 200% increase in chicken consumption in the last uh, 30 years and about a 20% decline in beef consumption. So if uh, these patterns match what you see uh, in the Ngram viewer. If you look at animal welfare, well, this was when Peter Singer's uh, Animal Liberation was published. And you can see there's not much mention of it in the books up until 1975, and then suddenly it takes off. And animal welfare versus animal rights. The animal rights terminology is much more popular than the animal welfare terminology. And um, I'll talk about, a little bit more about that at the end. But Hal was sent, uh, obtained the um, AKC um, breed registration data uh, a few years ago. And he's been sort of combing, he was combing through that at the re re relative treasure to trove. And what he found, for example, was that there were nine breeds that showed this pattern where they were not very popular and then suddenly they took off and then they declined. And you can see it's about a 25 year period. Up and decline. And the Dobermans, the sheepdogs, Rottweilers, Dalmatians were heavily influenced by 101 Dalmatians and the increase and decline was even sharper. Thinking about people's attitudes towards animals on the road. In this, this particular study looked at whether or not people 
deliberately swerved to run over the animal. And the control was a, a styrofoam cup, the turtle was a plastic turtle, and the snake was a plastic snake. And so looking at the frequency, you can see that eh, maybe it's 2% ran over the cup and 2.5% ran over the, the turtle. Maybe there's a difference there. But the snake, 1.5% ran over the, uh, the cup, and 3.6% ran over the snake. So it seems like snakes definitely do inspire more, of con more fear, more hatred, to the extent that people will swerve to actually run over a snake. Some people will. And when you look at the gender issues, you'll find only 0.5% of the people who did that were women, and 4% of the people who did that were men. And it's well known that there's a gender bias in the animal movement. It's about 80% female, 75% female. And Howell did a study in which he looked at attitudes to various animal issues, shows that they change by women are more positive towards animal protection by about 10 to 15 points. If you plug that 10 to 15 points into a usual Gaussian uh, bell curve distribution, you get at either end, you get about three times as many women on the supporter side and about three times as many men on the opponent side. So it's, that's about what you see, 75% of the movement is women. So it may simply be a function that there is more concern about nurturing and animal protection amongst women. The movement itself in this country, it uh, was formed in 1865 to 1920 stagnated for 30 years between the wars. It was rejuvenated after the uh, war, uh, World War II. The activist period lasted about 15 years, maybe 20. Some people may disagree with that because there's great interest in demonizing uh, any sort of discussion about animal welfare that you don't agree with as animal rights, where animal rights is regarded as anti-human um, and demonic in various ways. And then from 1990, 1995 onwards, there's been a consolidation of the gains that were made uh, back here. Um, if you look at the growth of the movement, uh, in 1948, um, only 37% had even heard of the anti-vivisection movement. 8% um, of the public opposed the use of dogs, compared to 19, 2001, when 54% of the public opposed the use of dogs in research. Um, in 1976, 1.2% of the public were members of an animal protection organization. That climbed to 6% in 1990, and 9% um, in 2000. So you can see that the animal, you know, the animal movement is growing. Why? Why is it doing that? I mean, th there are a whole host of potential reasons for that. If you look at attitudes, um, one of the problems about studying attitudes is finding questions that are asked the same time, same way, in the same manner, time and time, and time again. And the National Science Board um, uh, comes out every two or three years with a uh, survey of science indicators, and they ask a bunch of questions about various science issues. And for 1985 to 2001, they asked a question, they, asked, they basically made this statement and asked you whether you supported it or opposed it. And what you can see is that support dropped from 63% to, uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, 44%, and opposition went from 30% to uh, 52%. So um, what's interesting to me about this was that 1985 was when the Animal Care and Use Committee was, was reinstituted in our universities. And um, part of the reason for reinstituting that was to answer public concerns about animal research. Looking at this data, how well would you say that the IACUC has done in addressing those concerns? A note, by the way, that mice are less favored than dogs and chimpanzees. Um, 2001, they also asked that, made that statement about mice, and 68% versus 30% opposed. And in these studies, you find females about 15% more positive than males. And the attentive public, this is the group that says they really are interested in, in science and research, is about 8% more positive. And it's, it's not a big group. It's only about 15% of the public. Um, in terms of uh, looking at some of the sort of stuff, another interesting study was done in 1999 by New Scientist. And they asked two questions. Scientists should be allowed to experiment on animals. This was regarded as the cold start. 
and this was the warm start. Some scientists are developing and testing new drugs to reduce pain or developing new life treatments for life-threatening diseases by doing research, uh, by allowing experiments in animals. They should, you know, they should be do allowed to do this by allowing uh, experiments in animals. And so this is the difference between the cold start, 44% disagreed, 25% disagreed. If you add up the agreed in the warm start, you get 45%. If you add up the uh, agree, uh, disagreed in the warm start, you get 41%. So they're about equivalent um, in the warm start. So how you ask the question is, not surprisingly, most of us already know that, is very important. But it's interesting to see this really sort of given some actual numbers and some actual data. Here's another issue about uh, the, from the same survey. Um, looking at whether or not you support the use of mice in, in particular research. This is for a leukemia drug. This is for cosmetic testing down here. New painkiller, test pesticide, I forget what these two are. And, but what I was interested in in this case is that the um, blue bars are when mice experience no pain and illness, and the red bars are when mice experience pain and illness. So it's about a 25 percentage point lower score when mice experience pain and illness. Pain and illness is, and uh, the welfare questions are very important in all of this stuff. Uh, international comparisons, if you look, the same statement was given out for, uh, um, to people uh, internationally in one of these studies in 1993, I believe it was. And the percentage approving in France was 27% versus 55% in Japan. It was 53% that year in the USA. Disapproving 68% of France. Not sure why the French come out so disapproving, except for the fact that France has always had a very particular interest in both dogs and chimpanzees and apes. And it may be that the animal species chosen uh, produced these sorts of results, because you certainly don't see that in French public policy. The French are not nearly as concerned about animal research uh, as these numbers would indicate. Uh, the HSUS looked at the whole question of pain and, and distress and uh, looked at if the animal experienced severe pain and distress, moderate pain and distress, or little or no pain and distress. And what you find is that the disapprove is 75%, 60%, 33%. And these are enormous changes in a public opinion poll based on such minor changes in wording. And so once again, em emphasizes the importance that the pain and distress question has. Um, slide showing Peter Singer's influence. Um, it is, um, as I say, um, one of the sort of landmark books in the animal, uh, in terms of discussion of animal issues. And the good news is you only have to read the introduction in chapter one, because the rest of it uh, is just a catalog of sort of horror stories or vegetarian recipes. <laughs> It's the only philosophy book that does have vegetarian, or maybe there may be more now, but it's, it was back then. Um, I want to talk a little bit about animal rights and animal welfare. The, the animal rights argument, it's often made that, oh, they're animal rights. And it's either used as a um, phrase of condemnation or as a phrase of pride. Um, and yet, this very notion of animal rights is, is problematic from an academic perspective. Um, there are four different ways in which this term is used. And sometimes they're used all four at the same time. There's the common position. And if you talk about the common position, you will find that 80% of the public think that animals have rights. But in that same poll, you will find that 85% of the public think it's okay to kill and eat animals. So whatever rights they're talking about who, the people who are answering this poll, it's not the right to life. So it's, so I mean, but that is the common position. That's the same sort of common sense position that was, uh, that Sarabji sort of talked about in ancient Greece. You have the philosophical issues, philosophical position. And here you have rights as a very sort of clear philosophical definition of um, a claim that cannot be overridden by claims to utility. It is a right. It can, you cannot say, well, it would be useful for me to do X. You, that will not suffice. And you have the different, you have the deontological traditions in philosophy, you have the utilitarian traditions in philosophy, and they argue with one another. I always remember 
an exchange between Tom Reagan, who was an animal rights philosopher, and Peter Singer, who was a utilitarian philosopher, about whether, you know, their particular positions. They both believe, at the end of the day, in practice, the same thing. But they went back and forth about who is rights, who is utilitarian, and so on and so forth. And, and Peter Singer was saying, it sounds utilitarian to me. And Tom Regan was saying, it sounds like rights language to me. And they were, you know, sort of, I guess, barbs at each other. Then you have the legal issues. And this is established through uh, legislation and through common law, and through the courts, whether or not you have a right not to be used in a certain way, and so on. And then finally, you have political. And rights, language, and politics is very important in America. Not as important in Europe. But in America, you know, the rights of man, Thomas Paine's pamphlet. I mean, this is a very key political discourse terminology. And so all of the movements trying to sort of gather greater attention for their particular um, disenfranchised community would use rights language, from civil rights to women's rights to um, gay rights and so on. So you have these four different, um, approach, uh, four different approaches. And so what rights are we talking about? Generally speaking, that's never really sort of identified. In practice, what you'll find is that um, animal rights can be used to distinguish groups that focus on both killing and animal suffering and groups that focus largely on animal suffering. So those are the two distinctions, really, that one might um, be concerned about. And so, you know, that, that, would be, that would be the challenge. The other thing that's often um, uh, conflated is that people use animal rights language to conflate um, the notion that um, you're an extremist. Somehow or other, you're an agitator, an activist, or whatever. In actual fact, whether you're an animal rights individual or not, bears no relation to the tactics that you use, the political tactics that you use. You can be an extremist, or you can be a card-carrying, compromising, pinko commie liberal, you know, whatever. Um, and so the, it's the tactics are different from the position. Henry Spira was an animal rights act activist, but tactically he was very different from the tactics that Peter used. And, and similarly, you'll find that there are these different distinctions around the, the animal protection movement as to who does what and how, and how it is done. So uh, the, the, the other issue that has always disturbed me is the, the, the fact that in universities around the country, there's not a lot of uh, tolerance for some of these sorts of issues to be raised, um, especially, especially in the animal research arena. And I've been involved in the animal research debate since 1976. And I've seen um, dialogue and discourse come and go. And today, it's mostly gone. There's very little interest in talking to uh, me or my colleagues on what we think about particular animal welfare issues in the research arena. Um, and I see the same sorts of things happening in terms of um, dog breed, uh, the breed issues, and um, <coughs> what to do about pet ownership and things of that nature. Uh, we are holding a conference in Washington on purebred dog health. Uh, there's a big problem about the uh, health problems with specific breeds. Uh, we've brought Sir Professor pa Patrick's Professor Bateson over to speak at, uh, as, as the uh, uh, keynote speaker. Everybody else is, works at a university somewhere or other. And the, um, the breed community is incensed that we should do this and just doesn't want to attend. That's fine for the breed community. Where it really bothers me is when it happens in universities. Because universities are places where there should be a, an opening. There should be an invitation to bring people of different opinions and ideas into a university setting and examine and explore why you have those different ideas and all the rest of it. And, but universities are not doing that today. And it bothers me that they don't do more of it. Um, they tend to be very satisfied with the dogma and try to keep the critics, the unwashed masses, out. So by now, you should be thoroughly confused um, and in terms of this sort of thing. And the only consistency about our attitudes and interactions with animals is inconsistency. 
we're very inconsistent into this. But it's, it's a wonderful, it's been a, a wonderful 35 years, actually it's 35, not 30, um, uh, voyage through this variety of contradictory uh, behaviors and attitudes. So I leave the last word to Gary Larson, the patron saint of any of us who deals with animals. <laughs> And if you'd like to make a comment or ask a question, please just wave your hand and we'll get that microphone to you. Yes, we have somebody down front. Thank you. Thanks. Hello. It says it's on. Can no, no. It's working? OK. So maybe it's that the British are smarter than us, but it seems to me that the UK is about 20 years ahead of where the United States is from a societal standpoint, from a legislative standpoint as well, when it comes to animal welfare, animal perceptions, the, and the regulations in place in, in raising farm animals. I was wondering if you could comment on why there is, in my, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm perceiving it uh, not in the appropriate way, but why there seems to be a disparity there. It's, it's not really clear why there is. Um, yes, the question was why is there a disparity between the U timing of UK animal protection and US animal protection? And there is, I mean, um, the farm animal issue in this country really only began to become an issue around about 2000, 2005, uh, whereas it became an issue in Europe in 1980, not just UK, but the whole of Europe. Uh, and what was interesting there was that the European Union decided to put some real money into farm animal welfare research. So from 1980 to 1990, there was a lot of research done, a lot of money was put into it, a lot of universities got lots of grants and so on and so forth. And, um, uh, and you got a, an informed discussion developing out of that. Um, in this country, that didn't really start until about 2000, 2005. And people have generally, as a shorthand, said America is about 20, 25 years behind Europe in terms of animal protection. Um, I think you can argue that. You could probably argue differently. What I see, for example, in the um, animal research arena is that the US is developing new technologies and Europe is impl uh, implementing politically these new technologies perhaps faster than the US. So there's much more attention paid to the idea of alternatives to animal testing in, in Europe. And you can go to a meeting a week, two meetings a week over there. Whereas here, it's not nearly, uh, there isn't as much tension. There's, people aren't organizing meetings about it and things of that nature. There just isn't as much energy on the, on the topic in this country as there is in Europe. Um, so. So maybe, I, when you look at money, um, which would be another measure, the British don't donate more money to animal protection. It's about the same per capita as it is in this country. So you can look at various different measures and you can say yes or no, as the case may be. Uh, would you be willing to speculate as to whether our attachment and perception of animals is registered differently in the brain as uh, compared with our attachment and perception of humans? I'm always ready to speculate. <laughs> yeah. um, I think it is. I, I think that uh, when you start looking at some of the attachment um, theories and, and measures, it doesn't seem to be too dissimilar between humans and animals. And indeed, why would it be? You know, I mean, uh, um, there may be a difference once again in degree, but I'm not sure that it would be a difference in kind. That is if is if you believe in evolution and would expect our attachment behavior to come from, say, animal attachment behavior. Thank you, Dr. Rowan. Uh, 
I'm Dr. Sally Foote, a veterinarian from a small town locally, and what gets very frustrating is people still purchasing puppies from like boutique shops and such while well, they'll still express that they hate puppy mills and you know that uh, they think that's horrible. So any comment on what is the most effective way to really have the public know and understand uh, not to say purchase puppies and such from pet shops and things and you know seek adoption first? It's not an easy challenge. I mean, H.L. Mencken once said that nobody ever lost money by underestimating the intelligence of the American public. <laughs> and if you watch TV shows, you might well believe that uh, at this stage. So, so it's, it's, and I don't wish to imply that America is different from England, because I'm sure the same is true in England. But, but the, um, uh, you know, these things take time. And um, all I can say is that the, there's been a tremendous change in pet keeping in America in the last 30, 40 years. I mean, as a vet private practitioner, you will see that people are prepared to pay more than they did. I mean, if you, if you track overall veterinary income, it's risen faster than inflation for the past 10 years. And it may not seem like that, but it, but it ha I mean, the, the official figures say that it has. Um, and, and so the, there's, uh, when you look at smoking, it took thir 40 years for people to start to d decrease smoking and things like that. Uh, so the Surgeon General's report took a long time to take effect. Um, when I look at um, euthanasia in animal shelters, uh, the, the standard in 1970 was about 115 per thousand, uh, animals euthanized in shelters per thousand people in the United States. Today, that's 12 and a half animals per thousand people. So it's dropped by 90%. And the veterinary profession has had, a, has, had an enormous impact on that over the years. And so, so, so I, I think we just need to sort of identify why people get animals. And, and so we don't, we're not very good at market research. We have been, I think, singularly ineffective in dealing with that issue. I have some concerns about this notion that every dog or every cat has to be sterilized because if everyone is, there'll be no more puppies. And we already today have about 400,000 puppies a year by CDC estimates being flown in from the Far East and Russia. And I can assure you that this is not a happy trip for these animals. Many of them arrive dead, but the, the profit margin is such that you can breed a puppy for $10 in Russia fly it over here and sell it for 2000 So you can lose a little, you can lose a few on the way. Doesn't matter, you know. So, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, big deal. And a law was passed saying you couldn't import puppies under six months of age. Nobody's enforcing it. So, 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 so the more we stop puppy breeding in this country, the more we're going to start getting puppies coming in from other countries because the demand is there and that will pull the thing. So we need to understand the marketplace much better than we do. And my fantasy is that we'll end up, the local humane society will have, use high-tech sort of P2P, people-to-people -people software to connect somebody who wants a Labrador with somebody who has a Labrador. Mm -hmm. and, you'll, and, and then they'll, they'll benefit in many ways. They'll be able to send fundraising material to the, both people. They know so and so's breeding Labradors, so and so has a Labrador, both can become donors. So I, I think that's part of the answer to, to this whole, whole situation. But we are down to a point where very few, as a percentage level, very few um, animals, or dogs and cats, are sort of w now wasted, if you want to call it that. And it's how efficient can we make the market is part of the issue here. You know. Hi, your previous slide said something about this being a, a rich topic and delving into it. Um, it's also a painful one if you care for animals. Um, just, and, it, and you've obviously studied this a lot. I'm wondering how you keep uh, courage or strength in the face of that because it is, it's so painful sometimes to read about things. And um, if you feel there's hope right now, if this is a good moment and that's what sustains you or uh, just an intellectual interest or whatever you can offer there. I, I look at the historical record as a way of sort of figuring out whether or not one's having an impact, and if so, how much. And the companion animal statistics are 
I was just quoting, there used to be 25% of dogs in California were stray in 1965. There are no, well, there are still a few, but not 25% of the dogs. Um, the, so the shelter problems are much, much better than they used to be. Um, the uh, animal research numbers are down. Used to be 50 million a year were being used. I, the, we're still breeding quite a few mice because of the genetically modified mice, but um, the actual use is probably half that, if not less than that. And you see tremendous changes being taken place in terms of animal research. Wildlife is a problem, and factory farming is a problem. You know, those are the two areas that are uh, perhaps the most um, challenging. But I'm beginning to see big changes beginning to occur in, in the farming arena. It, you know, we've got uh, um, India has 200 million laying hens, the third largest laying flock in the world. And they're beginning to now sort of say, OK, we need to worry about cage-free eggs. The Animal Welfare Board of India just said starvation, forced molting is, is illegal, it's cruel, can't do it. That doesn't mean to say people won't, but at least it's now been announced that it's illegal and they can be prosecuted for it. I see lots of signs of hope. And, and to me, uh, you know, you wake up in the morning and, uh, and uh, I mean, in the world as it is today, if you uh, have any interest in the environment, the only way to exist is to be what I call an optimistic pessimist. You look at the data, you have to be pessimistic. You get up and do something about it, you have to be optimistic. So that's the, that's the mechanism I use. Um, and, uh, but the, the animal business is tough on people. There's a lot of compassion fatigue, a lot of burnout. And it's the scores that we see in terms when we measure shelter workers are higher than any other caring profession in the country. On one of your slides concerning the issue of animal rights and the confusion surrounding the term, you had a bulleted point uh, stating the specific policy of the Humane Society of the United States on the website. As a speaker representing the HSUS today, can you state what that specific policy is and please comment on how the policy relates to production animal products in the U.S.? You're, you're talking about um, our policy on animal rights or what? What your position is on what you believe to be, are you an animal rights group or are you an animal uh, group that supports welfare of animals? I would argue that we are a mainstream animal protection group that supports the welfare of animals. Okay. I'm not sure that there's a specific explicit sentence that says that in the 10 or 15 pages of policies that are on the website. Um, in terms of the farm animal issue, we do have a one-page policy on farm animals. I personally am on the board of Humane Farm Animal Care. Uh, I'm there at the behest of my CEO, Wayne Pacelli. Uh, he's on the board of Global Animal Protection, which is another one of these sort of uh, certifying organizations on the food animal issue. But we think that factory farming is unacceptable. The, and let me use a, a less um, uh, emotive term, uh, industrialized animal, intensive animal agriculture. Uh, I don't think it's acceptable to keep the animals the way they are. And I think it's bad for the animals, bad for the environment, bad for communities, bad for climate change. And so, so I, I would argue that we need to change the system. Okay, so then if you are against the use of commercial farming in the U.S., does... No, no I didn't say that. Oh. I said intensive animal agriculture. Okay. Does the HSUS then relatively support the use of different type of farming in the U.S.? Or what is your position on how the animals should then be produced in the U.S.? Well, we support, if the, at all. we support the humane farm animal care system. We support uh, um, the global animal protection system, with both of which uh, establish standards for animal agriculture that are different from the ones that are currently used. Not as intensive, not as, uh, not as um, heavily confinement-based. Um, both of them are going to take time to, to change. We, we understand that. It's, I mean, the, the proposed laws that are around the country to change the battery cage system don't say you have to do it today. They allow the industry time to disinvest out of these systems and, and invest in new ones. Um, so our, our main approach is to push um, the current system out of existence and to see what new system might come into play. You know, we'd like to see, and we'll have an opinion on what that is. I'm sure we will. 
but it's not to uh, it's it's not to say no farming. Thank you for the comment. Hi, Dr. Ron. Um, I'm a fourth year veterinary student, and uh, I have found in my experience that um, veterinary students and oftentimes the veterinary profession in general tends to be quite militantly and vociferously opposed to animal rights, animal welfare, and oftentimes even a, any change in the status quo of the way animals are dealt with in our society. Um, so I suppose my question is, how important do you think is the veterinarian's role in public perception of animals in the way that they're treated? Well, the veterinarian's role is very important indeed. Uh, when there was a, a, an initiative petition in Massachusetts uh, back in 1992 on farm animal, basically to end veal crates um, and a couple of other minor changes, uh, it didn't pass. But when both sides polled and the person who would have been the most credible advocate was the dean of the veterinary school in Massachusetts. Um, most people see the, the veterinary profession as being the sort of arbiter of animal welfare. And you're right, but I would, I would argue that the veterinary profession isn't militantly animal wel against animal welfare. It's, militant, it's, it's saying it is for animal welfare, it's militantly against animal rights. And one of the original statements on animal rights was animal rights is a personal position that the profession has nothing to do with. Which quite frankly is a silly position. From, a, from an academic intellectual, it's silly. But there's been this extraordinary attempt to try and divide oneself from animal rights, which is seen as, as negative, as undermining, as subversive, and animal welfare, which is seen as good and calm and everybody will be sensible about animal welfare. Um, on the comments about um, animal agriculture and HSUS's opposition to what you call intensive animal agriculture, can you define intensive um, from HSUS's perspective? Are there certain metrics attached to that or production practices? It's a, it's a shifting system. It's, but I mean, the, we, we just start now with battery cages and gestation crates, I mean, uh, and uh, gestation crates, you know. Uh, we don't have to go much further than that. That's where we can start. But then as, you know, as the system develops, we would hope to have more enrichment and more um, availability. We, are, we have said no cages in, 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 in California, and we're continuing to sort of push that, that approach. See what, we'll see what happens. It's, you know, this is the political debate and uh, somebody's going to win it, I guess. What about, I would say, science or research on the other side when it comes to things like gestation crates, talking about that being good for the welfare of the animal, protecting piglets, that type of thing? Uh, well, you know, how would gestation crates be good for the welfare of the animal? Well, keeping a many hundred pound sow from rolling over on babies and crushing no, them. That's a, that's a farrowing crate. I'm talking about a gestation crate. She's living, she's pregnant now. She's in the crate for her pregnancy. How's that good for her? I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's a real, ch you can make some arguments, but I think that this is where it comes down to what is the psychological makeup as well as the behavior. And what you'll find in this whole debate is that there are four or five outcomes, metrics, that are used, behavior, production, uh, uh, production uh, numbers, um, physiology and, uh, and um, biochemistry, morbidity, mortality. So take those as four measures of welfare. And each one of them will come out in a slightly different spot when you look at them. But in terms of behavior, a gestation crate is an appalling. It gets zero on a scale of zero to five. Now maybe on physiology, it gets, maybe the, uh, the gestation crate uh, is comparable to a family pen, the Swedish family pen system. Maybe. Maybe in morbidity and mortality it's comparable. But in terms of behavior, 
there is no way you can, you, you can accept that. But, in, but if you think that a pig doesn't need to behave, well then, then it's fine. You know, I mean, that's, these are the sort, there's, there's a whole range of discussion and argument that needs to be sort of taken into, brought into, into position here. And there's, there's, we're only just beginning the discussion in this country. It's been going on for, as I say, for 30 years in Europe. But it's only just beginning in this country. Hi, I'm a second year vet student. And first of all, I'd like to thank you for bringing the discussion here because yeah, I thought your talk was great. Um, I got involved with animal rights work back in at the heyday, like in the 80s. And since then, it seems that I've seen a decline in activism, maybe grassroots activism. And I wonder if you think that that's the case or if it's just my perception. And if it is the case, why do you think there's been that decline? Well, there's a, there's a fascinating article written by Bill Moyers, the Movement Action Plan. He was a sociologist, he's dead now, and it's not the Bill Moyers of NPR or national television fame. Um, but he, he, was a, so he was an activist in, in San Francisco, and he talks about the, the eight stages of a movement. And f stage four is where the movement suddenly gets press attention. And that's what happened in the 1980s in this country on the animal rights movement. Large amounts of press attention. But by 1995, there weren't any, uh, Parade Magazine was no longer writing stories on the animal rights movement. Mind you, what you had instead was Kramer talking about protecting the chicken, you know, on Seinfeld. So you, it had become incorporated into the general discourse, as it were. But you no longer had special, it was no longer new, it was no longer novel. Journalists weren't going to be writing about it at that, at that sort of time. So, so, so the interest in the sort of, that sort of overt public uh, media exposure dissipated. Um, some people saw that as a, as a defeat. Other people saw it just as part of the natural progression and to um, what uh, Moyers would term phase six. So he goes from phase four to phase six. Phase five is a dead end phase in which people become more activist, more aggressive in order to get more media. And it ends up burning itself out, which is what to a certain extent has happened. But phase six is now you're beginning to sort of work within the system, work with the legislators and things like this. And I think that phase six is going along just great at this point in time. You know, I mean, there's tremendous amount of change occurring. Um, in this country. And so, uh, um, so we're well into phase six at this point. You have a lot of young folk here, and I wonder if there's any institutions that you would recommend they, they contact or research funds that there might be small that they could get a starter in this field. Um, there are um, uh, some foundations that will support this type of work. Um, there, um, uh, there's not much that's coming out of the federal government. The USDA used to provide some funding for uh, animal welfare. It's, I think it still does to some extent, but it's, uh, the USDA research funds have been cut. Um, uh, and there, there has never been in this country the type of intensive support of research that there was in Europe. And, and I think that's part of, the, it's part of the challenge here, is that if we want to develop new systems, there's going to have to be research into the new systems. And uh, I'm not sure where that money is going to be coming from. Certainly not now, with the, the emphasis on that. But there are small grants out of foundations. There's a group called Animal Grant Makers, which is an affinity group, foundation affinity group. And people will provide a little bit of money there. But on farm animal issues, there's not a heck of a lot of research money that's, that's available. Andrew, you might want to mention the HSUS University that you were telling my students about. Okay, well, we do have, we have established uh, what we call Humane Society University. It's a degree granting institution. It's a virtual university just online um, that uh, we've been get granted permission by the District of Columbia to grant undergraduate degrees and graduate certificates and hopefully this year, uh, master's degrees. And we're slowly building up the uh, set of offerings of courses and things of that nature. So anybody who's interested uh, might want to look out, check out Humane Society University. Uh -huh.
comments? We've been over here for quite a while. Let's keep these people on the side. And we will come back to you. May I ask it since I have the mic in my hand? <laughs> Possession is nine tenths of the law, yeah. You got it. Uh, the, the point was made in uh, one of your slides about, uh, you know, where the chickens, we would started giving a lot more of those and the, the cattle and the swine. I think the point there was, uh, you know, a lot of it's economics. Uh, you can raise a lot more chickens on a truckload of corn than you can uh, cattle or pigs. Uh, also, along that same line, through the centuries, we've gone more and more to eating animal flesh as such. And because of that, I think it's an easier way to get the protein. Some of the countries you mentioned that uh, as being maybe ahead of us in their treatment of animals or use of them are actually importing those very things from the U.S. And even though there may be other ways to get the protein or get the nutrients to these other countries, there certainly isn't enough arable land in the world to try to feed everybody in that way. So, uh, you know, I, I understand the argument here, but it kind of boils down to uh, well, how do we feel about the people in the other countries? Keep the mic and let me ask you this question. China is now up to about 50 kilograms per, per person, uh, animal product consumption. What happens when they reach 90 kilograms, the level we're at? Where's, where's the, where is all the soy protein going to come from? That's exactly the point. We're feeding yeah. them, but we're also feeding the world. I mean, we're well, feeding, we're, a lot of the stuff we're using to feed these animals are not the same corn that we actually use to feed the livestock. It's two different products out there. Well, it could Plus be we're using same. a co-product from other things that we do here in the US, such as the making of ethanol in the feeding of these livestock. Well, I think ethanol is the stupidest idea that's come down the pike in a long time, corn-based ethanol. That may not be a popular thing to say in, in Illinois, but uh, I, I, I- Not with $4 I, gasoline. I, I've, I, was a, uh, I, I was a biochemist, and I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me energetically to do that. Who am I? I'm not, I'm not making policy, so. But, but I mean, the, the thing of, uh, we shouldn't be feeding edible stuff into our cars, is the, the short answer there. And we should, be, uh, um, we should be concerned about what happens when China is eating as much meat, because we've got 300 million people. China has 1.2 billion. So if they're eating as much meat as we are, they're going to be sucking up, and they already are sucking up all of the stuff. It's not clear to me where how that's going to be possible, but it's certainly the trend lines look like that China's going to be doing that. And now we have a person over here that's been patiently waiting. You won't have to go to the gym today because you're getting exercise. Um, using the techniques I guess you were kind of discussing earlier with advertisements, um, HSUS is known for using also their animal imagery in their commercials to get people to donate money and support HSUS goals, I guess. If your goal is to help move away from intensive agriculture, how is HSUS helping financially support those changes that we see within the industry and uh, help support conversion from such as like gestation crates to a more humane method. How are they doing that? Do the, how does HSUS help support that? Do they, are they contributing any financial things to these livestock producers to help make the changes practical? I would argue that HF, Humane Farm Animal Care and uh, Global Animal Protection are both entities that will help producers um, maximize their income from high-end niche products that may grow into a, a larger market. I mean, as the organic market is growing, um, the humane market will probably also grow. If, you, if, if Europe is anything to, uh, to go by, uh, there's tremendous opportunity in the market to do this. Now, it's not, to my knowledge, HSUS isn't given money to get agriculture to, um, to support farmers in change. Well, the money we're given is to sort of protect animals and to raise issues about how animals are treated. Um, and so our obligation to our donors is to do that. And so the question of, of uh, whether or not we would give money to a farmer to make the change, I mean, we don't have enough money 
despite the hundreds of millions that people think that we have, we don't have nearly enough money to make even a dent in that. Um, I'll give you an analogy. We were asked to support chimpanzee retirement, lab chimpanzee retirement. This was back in 2000. And there was a bill going through Congress that was going to establish a chimpanzee retirement program. Um, we spent our money on getting the bill passed, and that produced $30 million in, in, in money to, to retire laboratory chimpanzees. We could never have given $30 million then, we couldn't give it today. So we invested $100,000 in, in helping to get the bill passed. We'd be happy to invest money in getting Congress to start appropriating some funds for changes in, in agriculture. Be delighted to do that, you know, and so that's, that's, what our, that's what our activity, that's where our expertise lies, not in funding changes in agriculture. But um, as we are approaching our 5.30 deadline, thank you so much for staying with us.